Hi everyone, it's Ken here. In this second of the three-part series on making gears, we're going to dive into the CAM, or computer-aided manufacturing. CAM is the process of programming your CNC machines to make a particular part. In this case, we're going to use CAM to program the cutting of the gear spokes. So sit back, relax, and enjoy as I go to work. In the last video, we took a blank piece of brass, cut it into a circle, and then machined it down to the right diameter, and then we cut teeth in it. Of course, we drilled a hole in the center. The objective in this video now is to cut out the spokes and drill some mounting holes here. There seems to be some confusion based on the comments I receive in other videos that CNC is just a matter of pushing a button and out comes a gear, which of course would be nice, but life doesn't work that way, at least not now. That misconception may come from the world of 3D printing where you pretty much do load up a model, push a button, and out comes a part, but in CNC it's much more complicated than that. But I thought I'd take you through some of the steps of how we tell the software exactly what it is we want to do and how we're going to remove this material. The first thing we have to do is uh, what's called a setup. The software needs to know how the part is going to be mounted on the machine and where it can find X, Y, and Z zero because everything is relative to that point. So what I've done, um, and this is arbitrary, this is the way I've chosen to do it for this part, it varies from part to part, but uh, since we have a center hole and we've been using that to relocate the part as I move it from the lathe to the mill and back, I'm going to use that as my zero point. So once that setup is done, now we can start to talk about how we're actually going to remove the stock. If I were doing this you know, by hand, I would probably take a, uh, a saw of some sort of reciprocating saw and I would just cut these pieces out and then you know, file them to the line or whatever. So you would think that if I was going to use CNC, I could just take a, an end mill it's just a cutting tool and I can just run it along the border here and cut that piece out. Uh, the problem is that when you have a high-speed tool moving cutting through uh, brass like this, when you get to that last point where you're freeing up the, uh, the waste piece here, the bit is going to grab into the piece and throw it. <laughs> And it can either it can it can break the bit, or it can throw it back into the part and take a gouge out of it, or it can throw it right in your face, and uh, that would be bad. So you can't do that unless this waste piece is is held down in some way. Now one way to do that would be uh, before I start this operation would be to drill and tap. Uh, holes and you'd have to put at least two in each waste piece so the part didn't so that the waste piece didn't shift and that would th that's a lot of time because my machine is uh, can't do tapping so I could drill the holes but then I would hand have to hand tap them and you know put two screws in each one and so forth now I will probably use that technique when I work on the on the really large you know the eight and a half inch diameter gear but this one this one's just about a four and a half inch diameter gear. This is the 198 tooth gear. What I'm going to do is just machine out the centerpiece. I'm just going to, you know, remove the stock bit by bit by bit until there's nothing left there. And then I will run an, an end mill around the edge to, uh, to clean it up. Now, in, in CAD terms, that operation is called 2D adaptive clearing. The first thing it needs to know is uh, what tool I'm going to use to, to do this. So I'm going to bring up my tool library here and I'm going to use a uh, 3 8 inch. Now the software is asking me for all sorts of information about how fast I want to move the, the end mill through the material. We'll get to that in a minute. All of these fields have to get filled in. The next thing it needs to know is what is it I want to cut. So I'm going to tell it that I want to cut out this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this. Um, the next set of questions um, have to do with specifically how I want to remove this material. 
And again, there are a bunch of questions, and you know, if we're gonna, you can make them more and more complicated depending on, on what it is you're doing here. But um, in this particular case, I'm just going to tell the machine that I want to go five thousandths deeper than the thickness of the material, and that's just to make sure that I've cut completely through. So what is going to happen here is the end mill is going to spiral down into the piece so that we're not just plunging down and tearing things. So we make a nice gradual approach into the piece and then when we get all the way to the bottom we sort of spiral out and then work out the corners. So let's take a look at what this simulation does here. Uh, we'll click the simulate and now we can run this. We can actually watch what the tool is going to do. You see it pulls into the corners here and cuts out each piece. Now we don't need to see the entire thing. But so what we can see is that at this point we've done a pretty good job here but we've well we haven't come all the way out to the edge I don't want to do that yet I want to take a finishing pass on all of that but because the uh, end mill is a 3 8 inch diameter it can't really get into these uh, these corners here so what I'm going to do now is add another step to clear out some of that material in the in those corners that we didn't reach because what I want to do on the final step is have a uniform amount of stock all the way around the edge that I just take off by just you know zipping an end mill right around the perimeter here I don't want to have extra stock so that the uh, I want to make the I want to make the operation such that the end mill is always removing the same amount of material as it goes all the way around the edge because that's what a finishing step should do it shouldn't have to bind when it hits more and more material you want a nice smooth path around here so the next step I'm going to add is a, um, a 2D contour now in this case I'm going to use a smaller end mill I think I'll use an eighth inch end mill and again we're going to have to go back and fill in all these feeds and speeds. Again, the geometry is the same. But here we're doing something that's called rest machining. And what it means, we're telling the software that I've already removed some of this material using a 3 8 inch diameter tool. So this way, this operation won't go back and you know cut air. You know, it will it will know that a 3 8 inch diameter tool has already been used, and just figure out the difference for me. Axial stop stock is is the straight down, how deep you're going, and radial is how close you come to the edge. So for that finishing pass later, I want to leave five thousandths of an inch. So now the end mill is going to clear out these three. Uh, corners that the 3 8 inch end mill couldn't clear out. A round end mill is never going to be able to get into a, a square corner, as you can imagine. So when you're using um, you know, CNC rather than cutting this out by hand, you're always going to leave round corners. I happen to like the way that effect looks. Um, if you don't, well then after all the CNC is done, you can come in here with a file and, and square these. Um, like I said, I like the way it looks, just the way it is. Um, so anyway, now I've removed enough material that I can now do my final pass, which just removes that last 5,000. So let's just add that. And this time around, I don't want to leave any stock radially, but I still want to leave thousands. I want to go five thousands deeper than the material. So 
And now as you can see, that last tool path is just going to take us around the edge and give us a nice finishing pass. So up until this point, we've defined the basic operations. There are going to be three steps to be able to clear out all of this material. But we skipped over the hard part, which is uh, the feeds and speeds. So let's take a look at that. For all the wondrous things that this software, which by the way is Fusion 360 from Autodesk, uh, it, you know, it does all these wonderful things, but what it can't do is figure out, it doesn't know what your machine is. It doesn't know if you've got a, you know, a full-size, several-ton uh, milling machine with a 20-horsepower uh, spindle on it, you know, which can just rip through this without even blinking an eye. Or if you've got a tiny little desktop machine like I do, in which case, you know, we're going to have to go nice and slow and... So anyway, I have another piece of software which is called uh, G-Wizard. And this is used for calculating feeds and speeds. Now what I've already done here is I've defined to this software what my mill's capabilities are. Uh, you know, what its horsepower is and all sorts of other neat stuff like that. So now we need to tell it, well, what kind of material are we going to be cutting? And it's going to be brass. The tool I'm going to use is a carbide end mill. It's... Uh, Three-eighths of diameter. It has four flutes. Um, now the cut depth. Uh, see, at, at this point, now you begin to do some experimenting, where you change various parameters and you see, you know, how it affects the feeds and speeds. So, the cut depth is 0.065. The cut width. I can go back and tell. Uh, Fusion 360, how much material I will allow the, the end mill to take in one pass. All right, so if I only um, remove uh, a third of what the tool is capable of, we just jumped up to 2800, which is the maximum my spindle will go, and a feed rate of six and a half inches per minute. Anyway, you can spend hours playing with this and trying to find the optimal parameters for how deep you want to go. Because we don't have to go the full depth. We can go, you know, half the depth and do it in two passes through the material. So, as you can see, there are, there are almost an infinite number of um, choices that you have for determining how you're going to move your, uh, your, your tool through your material. I've just spent the last half hour or so cleaning up the, uh, the cam operations here, filling in all of the speeds and speeds and all of the other parameters that we skipped over. I've also added a drilling operation uh, to take care of these uh, three holes here that are used for mounting the gear to the collet. While I was working on this, it occurred to me that if I machine out all of these pieces in one step, there's no place to put the clamps to hold this gear blank to the work tape. So what I've done is I've decided to do this in two separate passes. Uh, I'll clean out every other spoke while the, while the clamps are in these positions, these three positions. And then on the second pass, I'll move the clamps and remove the remaining material. So the next step now is to generate the g-code which is the programming language that drives the milling machine uh, for each of these three steps so let's start with this one it's called post processing and what the uh, what the cam program outputs is what's called g-code here um, and like any language when you see it for the first time it looks confusing but really, what we have here is just some setup information for the machine, loading up the first tool that we're going to use. But the majority of the G-code is a series of X, Y, and sometimes Z instructions telling the machine where to move the current tool that it's using. And they just go on and on and on as the machine moves the tool from point to point as it's doing its cutting. This particular operation is uh, over 5,300 lines of, of G-code. Once that's been done, it's a matter of copying these, uh, these G-code programs over to the machine that has the mill attached to it and loading them into the machine controller. And now the machine controller, uh, in much the same way, shows you what path the tool is going to take. 
as it cuts out these three sections. What it doesn't know at this point is where x, y, and z zero are because, as we said early in the, early on, uh, all of the G-code instructions are relative to that point that we chose to be x, y, and z zero, which, if you recall, was the dead center of the gear. So now, on the physical machine, I'm going to move the uh, the tool to that point. and then come over here and set X, Y, and Z to zero, which is why this crosshair is here now. So the machine knows that it's here in the center, and it knows that all of these instructions are relative to this point. So it will just begin moving from here. If you've liked this video, please hit the like button. And if you'd like to see the subsequent videos on how I build this clock, please hit the subscribe. If you're interested in my other projects, you can find them at my website, which is www.zeman.com. I will see you all soon.